Good morning. Good morning. Both Severin and Delmont have been working diligently to create photo directories for the churches so that we can connect the names and faces of people and get to know them a bit better. While all this was going on, I was intrigued by the snippets of conversation that I overheard in the halls. I heard hopes that the camera would make us taller and thinner and younger, or also more mature, more swag. <laughs> I heard the fears that wrinkles and gray hairs or zits might predominate in our photos. And I heard surprise. Wow, I look good in this photo. <laughs> Better than I thought I would or this is a wonderful picture of our family. Each photo captures a tiny snippet of who we are. Pastor, <coughs> parent, spouse, child, pet lover, musician, and member of a church family. And it's a blessing and a challenge of a photo. It captures the fragment of who we are so that others can look at that and put it together with our name and with their experience of us and who we are might start to grow in their hearts. That's the blessing. But the photo doesn't capture the whole essence of us. Our portrait is how we look. Our name links us to our families, but we are more than links and, of genealogy and looks. <coughs> Sometimes we cannot even ourselves name the entirety of who we are. Ask a man who he is, and you may get an answer like, I'm an engineer, I'm a pilot, I am a musician, I am an IT guy, I am a salesman. Men tend to, to define themselves by their careers. Ask a woman who she is, and she may say, I am a mother, I am a grandmother, I am a sister, I am a daughter. We tend to define who we are by our relationships. Ask a young person who they are, and they might just say, I don't really know. They are going through that wilderness time of self-definition, a time of searching out their true calling, a time of testing and sorting out their life ethics. And yet, periods of discernment are not limited to their young. There are several milestones in our life when we pause and consider who we are. Jesus was 30 when he was thrust into a time of discernment. Think about this. His mother had really high expectations of him. Before he was even born, she was singing praises to God for the one that would enter into the world through her. All generations will call me blessed, she sang. And after his birth, the poorest of the poor, the shepherds, came to him looking for a savior. And wise sojourners from another land brought him gifts fit for a king. When they took him to temple to do his sacrifice and his naming and other early, early in the stages of his babyhood, prophets and prophetesses held him and declared that their whole life's hope had been satisfied and that they were ready to go to life eternal. His father, Joseph, taught him everything he knew about carpentry. His cousin, John the Baptist, proclaimed him the one who would baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. Whoa, doesn't that just like, what if I told you that was your calling? <laughs> and a voice 
from heaven was heard <coughs> declaring, this is my son, my beloved. This is a great deal to live up to. It's no wonder that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a time to figure out what all of this meant. That's very good to be called the Son of God. But what does that look like? What does that mean for mission? Who are you, you Son of God? The three temptations that Jesus faced helped him fully embrace his status and his mission. <clears throat> they demonstrated his resolve and his authority. In the first scene of temptation, Jesus, who has been fasting for days on end, Jesus, who must be really hungry, is encouraged to turn an ordinary rock into a loaf of bread. He could have easily used his gifts to look after himself first, to assuage the gnawing that was going on in his stomach, or, like the rest of humanity, he could wait and rely on God for his needs and end his fast in God's time. Save yourself and demonstrate that your complete trust in God, even if you're suffering. In the next round, the devil changed tactics a little bit and invited Jesus to exchange his identity as son of God for a relationship with the devil, who, he says, rules the whole world of humanity. Now many would expect a Messiah to use political power and political might to rule, but Jesus' kingdom is of a different nature. In God's kingdom, hope lies in serving others and sharing resources, not by asserting worldly powers. The very last scene takes place atop of the temple in Jerusalem. What an awe-inspiring sight it would be to see Jesus jump and land safely. A magic trick like that offers an alternate path to fame and fortune. But Jesus isn't called to that. Jesus is called to serve others. Jesus is called to the cross. Turning from temptation is a foretelling of his last journey to Jerusalem and the parody of his crucifixion when all the taunts around him will sing out, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen and beloved one. Jesus knows who he is not. He is not striving to feed his ego, or win by might, or play it safe. He has the resolve and the authority to endure human suffering, to trust God completely, and to spend himself for others. Who are you? Our definitions of who we are can become temptations. For example, being a hard-working parent is a good asset, unless you start to do everything for your child, and you're overprotective. If your sole focus becomes your child, then you stunt their emotional and mental <coughs> growth. You lose sight of the big picture that God has for your life. If you are the best ever employee and you're willing to work late to get the job done, and you could use the extra money to support your family from the overtime pay, that's great. But not if it comes 
at the expense of relationships. <coughs> Deepening the love that you have by taking time to call a friend or snuggle close with one of your children as you read them a bedtime story or kiss your wife or husband goodnight or having a prayerful conversation with God. Temptations can divert us from our true calling. They can block our path to God's vision for our lives. The people of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness learning to trust the Lord. And Elijah spent 40 days there before hearing the still small voice of God on Mount Horeb, the same mountain where Moses spent 40 days listening to God give the law. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert comings to grips with his mission, figuring out what it really means to be the Son of God. And here's an interesting little fact. It takes 40 weeks to make a human being, 40 weeks of pregnancy before we are created in God's image and draw our first breath. So throughout these 40 days of Lent, we are called to contemplate the life of Jesus and his path to service and obedience in God, his living out of his identity as the Son of God. And as we do that, we must ask ourselves the same sort of identity questions, personally and congregationally. Who am I? Who am I really? And what is God calling me to do? And who are we as a church, really? And what is God calling us to do? These questions are important because the answers shape our lives. Are we a gathering of like-minded people who share a preference for a certain theology and a certain way of worshiping? If so, then we should design to provide for our own survival and take care of ourselves. Or are we people called together to be the body of Christ? Called to be Christians gathered around word and sacrament and then empowered by the Holy Spirit and sent forth into the world to spread the love of God. If that's who we are, and I believe it is, then the things we do will be designed to take care of the world and for others. <laughs> Rethink Church is an initiative of the United Methodist Church. It engages people in faith conversations online. And in this Lent season, it has challenged participants to explore their Christian identity through photography. One of my friends who's taken up that challenge posted a picture of her right hand and the stump where her left hand should be among the busyness of her desk. And she posted, I am a woman, a friend, a sister, a daughter, an amputee a chaplain intern, a student learner, a hugger, a girlfriend, a cook, an artist, and so much more. Ultimately, I am a beloved child of God. And there is the key. We are children of God. There's something in us that God loves not just appreciates, not just approves of, but actually loves. When God looks at you, it's like his eyes grow a little bit wider and his heart beats a little bit faster. He loves you and he accepts you for who you are. Max Lucado in his book, Grace, which is the book that we've been using to um, gear our Bible studies with, says, your identity is not in your possessions, in your talents, tattoos, 
kudos or accomplishments, nor are you defined by your divorces, deficiencies, debts, or dumb choices. We will make dumb choices. Lots of us have already made dumb choices, but we are still God's children. God loves us, and if God loves us, we must be worth something. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness struggling with that question of identity, struggling to discover what it meant to be the Son of God. Throughout the 40 days of Lent, we are called to do the same. In the next 40 days, we'll make that inward journey with Jesus and discover who we are. The photos arriving in the mail in the next few weeks might portray you as a basketball player, a pet lover, a staff person, a spouse, part of a family, or an integral part of our church family. The snapshots have captured part of who you are. This Lenten journey of discovery can help reveal to you God's full plan for you. Who are you? Amen.